He is risen. He is risen indeed. Indeed, he is risen. Well done. What, what a week can do to make us forget that, huh? Can you believe, congregation, that Easter Sunday 2019 has already come and gone? What a spring it has been, and here we are this week after Easter Sunday, and now for many of us, we are moving ever closer and closer to graduation parties, to finals, to the end of the school year, and to summer vacation. It seems that with each passing year, these holy days, or these holidays as we've come to know them, come and go quicker and quicker. I was visiting with my grandmother last weekend about this very thing, time flying faster as you age. And I think I recall her saying something along the line of, you're telling me. <laughs> but if you'll indulge me for just a moment, I'd like to pause the clock for just a short bit before we get too far beyond this Easter holiday. And I'd like to remind us of another part of this story that I think it's worth telling year after year. Hear these words from the Gospel according to John, the 20th chapter. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and gave to them the Spirit, saying, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written about in this book. But these are written so that you can come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you might have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So what part of this story stands out the most to you? Perhaps you find yourself relating to Thomas as he questions the possibility of a man being raised from the dead. Or maybe you sat amazed as you listened to the story of Pentecost. But in this gospel account, it's located at a much earlier point in the narrative than you remember. Or possibly you discovered yourself in this story for the first time, hearing Jesus' words in a whole new way. Blessed are those who have not yet seen and yet have come to believe. Whatever the case might be, I suspect each of us resonated with some part of this gospel account. And so this morning, I'd like us to unpack just a few of those details hopefully providing us with a chance to hear this storyline in a way that maybe we haven't before. I'd like us to start right at the beginning with verse 19. Here we find the disciples locked away in a room, fearing the Jews, as the passage says. The Jews, of course, being their religious leaders, <clears throat> who found Jesus guilty of heresy and condemned him to death just a week or two earlier. It's the evening of the resurrection. 
Mary has already discovered the risen Christ in the garden, and she's already run to tell the disciples her good news as Jesus had instructed her. This has already been quite an exciting day for the followers of Jesus, one undoubtedly filled with shock, possibly even dismay at Mary's outrageous claim. But now here we are in the house where the disciples are trying to gather themselves together after the crucifixion, where they're probably even planning their next moves, and suddenly there appears Jesus. And what are his first words to his friends? Peace be with you. Congregation, who but Jesus could have known what the disciples needed more than anything else in that moment. There they were, frozen with fear of persecution in that place of hiding. This was the exact message they needed in that moment. How many of us can resonate with Jesus' message of peace in our hour of need? I am reminded of those who are suffering when I hear of this part of the Easter story. I think of those who, who've had a serious diagnosis before. You've known someone like this. Perhaps this has been you. You get the bad test results, and, and then what? You freeze, at least for a time. It's hard to know what to do next. Do you ask for, for more opinions? Do you take time to grieve? Do you even have time to grieve? All of these thoughts swirl about your mind as you fear the results of the news you've just been handed. Peace be with you, says Christ. Or what about those who struggle with anxiety? I know this one all too well. All we do is fear. We fear the unknown. We fear the known. We worry about what we can or cannot do, stress about this situation or that possibility. Peace be with you, says Christ. Or maybe you're someone who knows financial hardship. Is the next paycheck not going to be enough to cover your expenses? How do you pay your bills and feed your family and save for college? Peace be with you, says Christ. It's profound to me that, that Christ shows up for the first time post-resurrection to his closest friends with those words. He could so easily have come in riding on a white stallion with fanfare and a pronouncement, I am risen! Blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Or maybe he could have been raised from the dead and then demanded that they worship him right then and there on the spot. Bow down before me. Would have been within his rights. But these were not the concerns of Jesus that first night post-resurrection. No, Jesus was concerned for the fear in his friends' hearts, so much so that he not only offered them peace once, but twice. People of faith, this is the intent of Easter. That because of Christ's victory over death, we no longer need to fear. We need no longer fear death. We need no longer fear retribution for our sins and to risk contradicting even the great FDR, we need no longer fear, even fear itself. The point being, Christ's resurrection is God's peace offering for the world. And the peace of Christ is offered freely to all who would receive it. So the question is, where in your life do you need peace? And is there something that is hindering you from receiving that peace today? Now, I'm assuming that the writer of this gospel must have anticipated that we would ask that question. What is hindering us from receiving that peace? Because the next lines in this morning's scripture, they provide us with a perfect example of someone 
who had a barrier in his own life to peace. Thomas has received an unfortunate reputation throughout church history. As a matter of fact, if you've ever heard someone called a doubting Thomas, you likely know that the next portion of this morning's scripture is the source material for that moniker. But here's the kicker. This scripture passage never calls Thomas a doubter. Let me explain. The English translation that sits in the pews in front of you, the New Revised Standard Version, appears to inadequately translate the word apostos as doubt, when in fact this Greek word means something more along the lines of unbelief. Jesus doesn't tell Thomas to stop doubting, but instead to stop his unbelief. Something Thomas claims for himself a few verses earlier when he declares, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails in his side, I will not believe. People of faith, it would be a mistake for the church to continue perpetuating the idea that doubt is somehow the antithesis of faith. As a matter of fact, in some ways, doubt is that thing which enables us to think through our beliefs enough to fully claim them as our own. Some of Christianity's most famous believers have struggled with their own doubts. C.S. Lewis, the author of the Chronicles of Narnia and other famous books on Christian thought, had many doubts of his own. He once wrote, Faith in the sense in which I am here using the word is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted, in spite of your changing moods. I think this is exactly what Thomas was struggling with in this scripture passage. I mean, how many of us, if faced with the the confirmed death of one of our closest friends, would believe that said friend had risen from the grave without some hard evidence? If anything, most of us would probably accuse the messenger of being insensitive during our time of grief. We would never entertain that resurrection were a physical possibility. And yet, in walks Jesus again. This time it's a week later, and Thomas is present now. Jesus, already heaven showing himself to the other disciples, turns directly to Thomas and readily offers himself as proof. Confirmation that he has, in fact, risen from the grave. Congregation, let's not miss the mercy of this moment. Here Jesus finds Thomas in a state, in a place where his life has lost all hope. And again, What's the first thing that Jesus says to him? Peace be with you. All that Thomas needed was to see Jesus alive. This confirmed for him the faith that had been in his heart all along. And this is true for each one of us, isn't it? For we all have questions from time to time. We all struggle with the inconsistencies that exist between the things of this world and the realities of the heavenly realms. And yet, despite the doubts that we face, each one of us has something that serves as a sign, pointing us ever closer to Christ, restoring our faith again. Dr. Caroline Lewis, she's a professor at Luther Seminary in St. Paul, calls the Gospel of John a full sensory gospel because there are numerous examples of people who come to faith or have their faith restored by bearing witness to some action that Jesus takes. For example, in John 6, the author describes the feeding of the 5,000. After Jesus had blessed and distributed the fish and the loaves, and everyone had been satisfactorily filled, many began asking, is this man indeed the prophet who has come into the world? In this gospel account, faith was born because those present literally tasted God's goodness. In John 11, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. 
And Lazarus, his sister Martha, attested to the finality of her brother's death when she tried to reason with Jesus, saying, there is a stench in there because he's been dead for four days. But just many moments later, those with Martha and her sister Mary, as they mourned, witnessed a miracle like none other. And they praised Jesus because of this stinky miracle. Congregation, you see it takes a, a different sign for every single person to come to faith or, or even to restore or maintain their faith in Christ. For some, it's a, it's a short prayer at one point in their life. For others, it's years of wrestling or questioning or debating. The wonderful thing, though, is that God knows what every person needs and will provide for every soul who seeks. Our role is to continue that seeking and listening for God's response. So I pose that question to each of you today. What's your sign? What is it that you need to ask of Christ today for the sake of your faith? For those of us who already know the climactic victory of Easter, there can still arise from time to time obstacles to our faith. And so for those for whom that's true today, I invite you to ask for what you need. Be honest with Jesus. He can handle it. And he will meet you where you are. And then again, there may be folks here this morning for whom this message doesn't feel as relevant for themselves. But maybe instead you're worried about the faith of a loved one. Perhaps a son or a daughter or, or maybe even a grandchild. Maybe you have someone in your life who has lots of doubts about God. Again, I invite you Ask him for what they need. He welcomes their searching. He does. For earnest searching ultimately leads to what is being searched for. You know, I think one of the best parts of the Easter story for me is that which it was for Thomas. That resurrection comes when we experience it firsthand for ourselves. <laughs> For some, it will look like seeing the hands, or smelling the death, or maybe even tasting the food before they can proclaim faith for themselves. For others, faith will come without seeing in this lifetime. Either way, just as the end of this morning's scripture says, Jesus offers peace to all of those who come seeking after him. Let us pray. God, your love never fails us. And grant us this morning the courage to face those unbelieving moments in our lives, those times that would try to keep us separated from you. Help us to see that despite our fears, you have peace for all of us who put our faith in your Son. Show us this morning even just a small reminder of his resurrection so that we might leave this place even more assured of him in whom we place our trust. Father, we love you, and we worship you this day and every day. In Christ's holy name we pray.